very much, Jennifer. Thank you to Annie and the whole group and to all of you parents out there working so hard uh, to make the system better. First of all, the most important thing that any uh, provincial government can do is to build and maintain a strong public education system. Uh, you know, you want it for your kids to succeed. Your kids need it and want it because they want to succeed and society certainly needs it because that's how we build and sustain a strong communities. The three things that I think help uh, make sure we have a strong public education system, and then they're not one, two, three, they're one, 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 so they're all important priorities. And the first and incredibly important pillar is well-trained professional teachers who are comfortable with benchmarking and using data to improve uh, uh, the continuous quality improvement within the education in the schools. The second thing is the strong curriculum, a curriculum that is giving your kids what they need to succeed when they leave. And the third thing is uh, engaged, involved parents. So those, to me, have always been three fundamental foundations of the system. Note I didn't say money. Uh, there's never been a school board chair who ever said to Gerard and I, or any other education minister in the history of the system, thank you government, I have enough. Mm -hmm. So that's always going to be an issue. This government's been very generous with the education system. We're about to walk into a really serious restraint, uh, and you can see Minister Duncan, the Premier, are starting to talk about that, so it's going to be really tough on the money side, um, but I think um, there are more important challenges for the government to face that faces right now. There's three. One, get back control of the College of Teachers so it's running in the public interest as it was designed to do. Mm. Two, start building in some of the same kind of, and there, there's been a great start on it. I mean, our government did some stuff. The current government is doing more stuff. Outcome quality measures. What they're doing, and you should, um, what they're doing in the healthcare system is phenomenal. It is improving care. It is improving um, uh, the use of resources in the system. It is tough. It is difficult. It's challenging for the professionals in the system, but it is giving better patient care, and what we need in education is a continual improvement in our education. So that kind of continuing to move down that quality outcomes um, uh, road. And the third thing is let's make those two years of Teachers College really, really count. They've extended the time that teachers get training. I think that potentially is a fabulous initiative, but let's make sure that those teachers are getting what they need to succeed in the classrooms in the colleges. Uh, because again, as you know, their challenges they're seeing out there are growing increasingly complex, and I think the best training we can give them uh, will probably help them more successfully deal with those challenges. Listen, I'm going to be quite, kind of brief, but I'm, I'm going to, and I was wondering, geez, well, what if Janet and I agree that we're not going to agree, so that's good. <laughs> You know, it's, so it's, education is, is, is a really, or, you know, much more dynamic and organic thing than, than people treat it. And top-down stuff is what gets the education system in trouble. The problem is it's been working reasonably well. It's kind of the worst case scenario. Uh, you don't have the edge. You don't have the motivation. And I think education is headed for a very difficult time because uh, it, it, without a mandate, a clear mandate, this is what propelled education for the last eight years with some small modesty. But this is what we brought into the election. But more importantly, it was developed with three years of input from people. And there's 35 problems. And you recognize everything that the ministry is doing is somewhere in this document that the premier himself had his fingerprints all over that uh, was done and put forward ahead of time. A mandate was obtained. The last two elections haven't done that. And while there are objectives there, getting things done is not sitting on the 22nd floor of your office and saying they're going to happen. It's about engaging people. So the things that I think are, are really important to watch out for is the, the Peace Foundation. I mean, frankly, there's negotiating taking place within a year, and it should not be presumed on that that's going to be all sales headed in, in, the, in one direction. I think it's going to be very, very important that um, people grasp the idea that education in Ontario is getting better, needs a lot more work to get where it really could be. In other words, if there isn't an ambition, if people don't get a sense of moving forward instead of what any kidder used to call awfulizing, because the temptation is going to be to pick the spots that are bad and, go, and drive for that. The impact of that is, is to leave the system without uh, a place to go. Uh, I think the government is going to obviously have to deal with the dollars situation. Uh, and, and there's been a 35% increase in funding in education net of inflation. Uh, those are the facts. The question is how sustainable is that? And it comes right back to the first point. It's sustainable as long as you're getting the results. And so I know there's a lot of discussion about test scores, but without test scores giving people a sense that things are moving forward, you're going to get less chance of things happening. There could be other outcomes, better outcomes. And there's an incompleteness, too. I mean, if you look at what was planned, there's a lot more things, a lot more dimension that was intended on top of 
literacy and numeracy and, and high school graduation. There's a, there was a whole ambition, and hopefully it's still held by the government, but that's not good enough. It has to be held by others. So, you know, I, I look forward to joining the rest of the discussion. The other thing I foresee as a problem is the link to post-secondary. You understand that there was 28% eight years ago of kids from high school going to post-secondary. Now there's 40%. That's an enormous increase, and it just it hasn't all been tucked in. And so with that, it's going to have to be organized. You're going to have to look at those large classes, a whole bunch of things, and it's going to have big impacts on the outcomes for for uh, uh, the kids that are coming through right now, the young adults that are that are hoping to go through. So I'm going to I'm going to take my red flag and sit down. Uh, my mother always said I I should be a minister when I grew up, and I guess this is about as close as I'll get. <laughs> um, I'll I'll make uh, it's great to be here. I'll make three uh, three points. I guess three challenges. I think the education system is facing, and and one does uh, follow on to what uh, Annie and and, and Patsy Salberg were talking were talking about. Uh, I do think. Uh, there's an excessive emphasis on standardized testing as the primary outcome, the primary goal. You heard it from the minister this morning. If you look in the, the liberal platform of the Ministry of Education uh, uh, website, there's uh, it talks a lot about student achievement, and student achievement is, is primarily measured by EQAO scores. So we heard a lot about the problems in that uh, this morning. Uh, I think if you talk to teachers, you'll hear from them that uh, there's too many directives, assessments, diagnostic tests that are getting in the way of them being the professionals, as we heard from Pasi Salberg this morning, that teachers really need to be respected as professionals in order to create a learning environment which encourages creativity, uh, encourages the breadth, breadth of learning outcomes, uh, skills, capacities that students need uh, to, to uh, succeed in, uh, in the 21st century. Uh, so that's one. Uh, the second, uh, it's already been mentioned, is, is, is funding. And uh, uh, so I certainly recognize that uh, uh, there have been significant investments uh, in education. I think that's great. Uh, I think progress has been made because of those investments in areas like early learning uh, in bringing down class sizes. And uh, I think that is very, uh, that's excellent. Uh, but I think if you look at People for Education's work, if you look at what's going on in the schools today, uh, you see that uh, there are schools, uh, the school boards are, are spending uh, $175 million more on special ed than they're receiving from the government uh, and still not meeting the demand. There's still many, many tens of thousands of, uh, of children waiting for special ed support. Uh, you see that uh, schools, fewer schools have full-time principals, fewer schools have uh, specialty teachers, uh, teacher librarians, phys ed teachers, uh, music teachers, that sort of thing. So there, there still are challenges uh, and uh, there was a promise to review the funding formula which is now almost 15 years out of date. Uh, I think the, the government and all parties really do need to move together with that review and engage, uh, engage parents, engage the public in a reflection about, I think that can lead to a reflection about what the goals are for our education system beyond test scores. And the final uh, point that hasn't been mentioned uh, from the panelists, but it was mentioned this morning, is equity. And uh, uh, I think uh, this is uh, a serious challenge that schools are facing, is the growing gap between different schools. Uh, uh, I think we hold quite dear to the idea, which again, Patsy Salberg was talking about, that all uh, students deserve the same access to learning opportunities regardless of their family income or the income of the neighborhood they live in. But uh, what we're seeing is uh, an engagement of parents, in, uh, in a, which is a good thing, but a lot of that engagement is around fundraising. Now, fundraising would be okay if it was equi equitably distributed. It's not, right, we know that. Um, so that the schools in wealthier areas are bringing in hundreds of thousands of dollars to enhance their education, where schools in lower income areas where the kids really need those opportunities are going without. So I, I think that is a third challenge that the government needs to address. Thanks. Uh, what should the government do next on the before and after programs uh, for uh, uh, the kindergarten age kids? that would actually bring to life the uh, full dimension of the Pascal report on early childhood education. Forward, I think that you got to have relationships between the schools and the, and the community organizations and, and I'm sure I don't know where the sharp edges have, have developed but you can't have 
school uh, related organizations in jeopardy as a result of things. And I'll say, I, I think there's a, there's a problem with, with uh, some of the models that were, were chosen. Uh, when, when we thought of this, it was going to be early childhood educators in the classroom. Mm -hmm. I'll be real clear about that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, and I think that, that if there's going to be extra education, you, you really have to look at the preparation. It's no denigration to teachers at all. It's just there's a different preparation and it's a different kind of thing that's happening. So, uh, but rolling out from 50,000 to 250,000 is, is going to be hard to do. It can't be done at the exclusion of other things. So I'm trying to say what it isn't because you, you've got to understand that just achieving that is not an achievement. Achieving that in the context of everybody, everybody agrees and sees how important it is. So I hope there's going to be some flexibility for school boards in terms of doing this. You can't do a one-size-fits-all uh, rollouts uh, of this kind of thing. Uh, there are boards who have a better handle, have more space, have better relationships. Uh, you've got to, and, and the dollars have got to come, and they've got to be enveloped for this. I know people hate enveloping, but you've got to pay for what you say you're going to do. Um, but it is, one well, thing I hope that people don't get lost in the implementation of It's a very valuable program. You, you talk about equalizing inequity and what you can do for kids, uh, you know, in terms of unleashing their potential by the age of four or recognizing their problems. It, there's no other measure that you can do that's going to confer that in the kind of system we have. So I'm hoping that that's going to be kept. But there are some, they should, should not be afraid to make the changes to allow this to implement well in every board across the province. I agree with uh, Gerard on uh, the original implementation was to be ECE. Secondly, uh, the one-size-fits-all problem is a problem, a, a, a big problem, because communities do have very different uh, issues, different strengths, different weaknesses. It's killing the daycare industry, um, and it's costing an awful lot of money to do this. Um, and so I think that uh, allowing communities and school boards more flexibility and how to roll out something like this, I think is really, really important. Um, the third thing is to um, make sure that they're tracking how effective it is. Because there's also been some evidence, um, you know, it's one of these things that instinctively parents and, and, you know, people say, boy, this is really great. You know, Gerard's articulated very well that, you know, give the kids, giving a kid, a, you know, really, really good start. But there had been some interesting uh, um, uh, research that said that when you looked at, when you compared outcomes at the end of your, you know, grade 12, kids who'd had it, kids who hadn't, there wasn't necessarily the benefit that everybody thought there was. So for the investment that's going into it, I think we need to track very, very carefully, is it really giving us what we think it should and what we think the children need, so that if it's not, we can the system can adapt and, and do what is necessary. I hear the word flexibility. Uh, I, th I think a number of uh, early childhood educators are concerned about um, <laughs> stepping back from having the schools running the before and after school program because that was part of Pascal's vision for a seamless, a seamless day, which uh, uh, you know something that's more than a uh, full day kindergarten, and and so it's a concern that uh, I think to a certain extent. Um, that there's a balancing of flexibility in terms of allowing uh, community organizations, not-for-profits, to be allowed. I think where the line has to be drawn, really, though, is, is ensuring that for-profit, big-box um, child care providers aren't coming into the schools. There are all sorts of pressures on the schools, I think, for privatization and, and corporate interests coming in. And, and so I would hope that the government would, at, at a minimum, ensure that the before and after school is a non-profit, uh, run by non-profit community providers rather than for-profit providers. Uh, many of you uh, probably saw and read the Toronto Star series on the College of, of Teachers and its growing tendency to restrict uh, public information on teacher discipline. What reforms in governance of the college are needed to ensure the public's right to know? There's a couple things. The College of Teachers was set up just like, again, many other professions in uh, not just Ontario but around the world. Have a governing body that's separate from your professional association or your union, and it has a very specific mandate. It's there for the public interest not the professional's interest. And it's a different mandate, and that doesn't mean one is better over the other, but it's a very different mandate. And what you saw with the series in the Toronto Star was that the balance has been um, tilted the wrong way in the College of Teachers. The College of Teachers was also really starting to, they were actually better than many of the regulated health colleges um, in looking at abusive behavior of, of teachers, of students, and they were recognizing what's called grooming behavior with those that are walking down the road for sexual abuse, and were really, because they recognized that as a warning sign, and they were trying to be very um, assertive about dealing with that, so we didn't have the 
kind of situation where a teacher, and again, it's a minority, but the teacher that is doing that kind of behavior it continues to be passed from school to school, and they continue to damage more kids. And one of the scariest things I had to do when I was um, first uh, came, came in as Minister of Education under the old system, um, the system went through a more uh, union-run um, uh, complaint system, and taking the license away from a teacher was something the Minister of Education had to do, and there were still some cases that were in the old system. And the three or four that the bureaucracy put in front of me to decide were 10 and 20 year histories of teachers who had been damaging children and had been passed from school to school to school. And I took away their licenses and I make no apologies for that. It is tough. It, there are judgments that that college has to make that are extremely difficult because you want to help professionals. Many professionals only you know need help to get better or to improve their behavior, so you need to make sure that you've got room for that. But at the end of the day, when you have to make a choice between teacher in the classroom and the benefit of the children, you have to err on the side of the benefit of the children, and that balance is seriously out of whack right now with the college. Well, I, I don't know what Janet's relying on when she says seriously out of whack. I mean, with all respect to the stars here, um, you know, the, the problem here is the assumption is wrong. It's not a profession or the public interest. It's professionals who can be trusted to uphold the public interest. And the, the test right now is for teachers, though. If teachers are going to run the college, as they should, as accountants run their professional body, as most professionals run theirs, then they have to uphold it and insist on the standards, and they have to own the college as a reflection of their professional ethics. So any failings of the college are a reflection on teachers right now because they're the majority in charge. Mm -hmm. And so the question is what happens, and some, some clear very, very transparent stuff. The most disturbing part of what seemed to be in the star was that, not that there were egregious problems, that every profession sadly doesn't have, is, is, isn't, uh, you know, immune, but that it, things were being allegedly swept under the rug or not being dealt with in a timely fashion and so on. And the, the problem is you don't want to have this to turn into a way of, of uh, changing that, that trust relationship. Because that's what we have. Teachers are trusted to look after kids. You, but you have to have, this body has to operate. It was dysfunctional, frankly, before the Conservatives came in. It was dysfunctional when the Conservatives came in because they let it become a battleground. And is it functional now? You know, frankly, that's something I wouldn't mind just having a look at because I'm, I'm open on it. But I, I have faith in the profession, but parents and others have got to say to the profession, you make sure this meets the highest standards because otherwise, you know, we don't have protection for students. This is the protection to make sure that the right people are at the front of the class and having those trust relationships. Joe Atkinson, who was the registrar of the college, and Joe came up through the unions. I mean, he was a teacher who, and, and ended up being you know, a senior leader within the union movement, expressed when he retired serious, serious concerns about the changes that had been made uh, in the college because he predicted exactly what has happened, uh, what the Toronto Stars has covered. <laughs> well, well, my question is, Janet, be really clear. What has happened? Do you think there's a widespread abuse of children taking place by teachers? Is that what you're alleging? That's I mean, what, what, what are you saying is taking place? Mr. Atkinson was part of a small coterie of people that ran the college. They were not, they were, where was their accountability? Well, that's just, just a sec. So, so, was, so but, but I think I should, to, to get to the root here, because we're, you know, you're, you're former Minister of Education and I am, do you think there's a widespread breakdown that is that is jeopardizing kids because that's what I want. Is that is that what you're saying is happening there now? I didn't say that, and don't put words in my mouth. What I said was, what I said was, is there every profession has this problem. The College of Teachers needs to be dealing with it highly, highly effectively. One teacher, one teacher you know, is in, in this, uh, like one doctor or one nurse is one too many in, when the, you look at the damage that they can do to a child. So the College of Teachers needs to function and function well. And I must say that the Toronto Star did, and you know, Toronto Star and our government were never the best of friends. Uh, but um, they do good investigative stuff many, many times. They put a lot of time and effort into it. And, um, um, you know, they, there were some real problems there. Te parents need the information, principals need the information, and the college needs, and the school boards need a system where a teacher that is not meeting those professional standards can either get the professional help they need to change or remove from the profession, and that is extremely difficult. And I agree with Gerard. It is a professional responsibility for teachers like it is for doctors, nurses, lawyers, accountants. Some days they get it right, some days they get it wrong, but we really need to, to get that addressed. Sorry. 
are there some things that you think could or should be changed in the way that the uh, EQAO uh, works so that teachers and parents can be make better use of the information that is uh, presented to ensure <coughs> that they can all support the success of students? Yeah, so we heard this morning uh, quite a vivid suggestion in terms of uh, randomized testing. Uh, Mr. Salberg was was concerned about testing every student every three years. He was mentioning, but we test every student. Uh, well, I guess that's right in terms of grade three, you know, grade grade six, grade nine. Uh, we do test every student, um, and uh, so if 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 we did a random sample, if it took some of the the focus off uh, teaching to the test, which we we know still occurs. Uh, if it if it created more space for, I mean, the complaint I hear from teachers is is that uh, all of these these diagnostic tests and, and the EQO test, what the, what it takes away from is is their opportunity to to do lessons which are uh, interesting, engaging projects which which aren't just the teacher talking and and, and the rote learning and, and which which I think is what uh, as parents. I think we have concern that, that our, our kids aren't as engaged in the learning process as we would like them to be. Uh, so, so, I mean, that's, a, that's an example is, is, is backing off to random testing and, and, and having a discussion about uh, the range of uh, learning objectives that go beyond uh, the two subject areas in terms of student testing. Gerard, any, anything that you would change because, you know, obviously... Well, I, I think the main thing is there there. You know, in 2004, the government adopted 10 goals, one of which is student achievement. And the question is, how do you get other, the other goals for achievement in arts, critical thinking, and so on, to actually have outcomes? Because you got to have outcomes to talk to the wider public. Only one in four people have a kid in the system. And so the EQAO or someone else that's objective, I mean, we cut the cost by about 40% of EQAO, and so it's about $30 million. It's not going to fix, it's often used, it's fixed so many problems that $30 million, I guess, that people want to use. But, so I, but I do think that getting those other objectives out there where they can be seen and where they can be measured is a way of, of offsetting that. The thing that we have in mind, the testing is meant to identify a child's need by grade three, do something about it by grade six, because otherwise they'll get lost in the system. That's why the NDP voted to put it in, that's why the Conservatives implemented it, and that's why the Liberals hung on to it, is that you, if you're going to pretend to run the system, and it is a bit of a pretense from the provincial thing, you've got to have a window in, and the public expect that. Uh, you're not going to get the funding, and you're not going to get the public understanding unless you see some of that. But it shouldn't become the only of ten objectives. And I think balancing that out, there, I think there could be a role for the EQAO. And if you read some of their stuff, it's kind of textured, and there is some. there are a lot of ideas in there how to bring some of the other objectives forward and uh, and teachers shouldn't feel that pressure but ultimately you do want kids to learn those things you just want them to learn them on the way to being able to learn other things as well and be able to, to get a real full education I, I think there might be a role for the EQAO in doing that thank you um, uh, Gerard has put it quite well uh, about the, the value of testing in the system and to me and, and I, again uh, your, your most important objective is student outcome, improve student outcome, and that's what the whole intent of the system is. Um, you need three kinds of assessment, um, and the, t the tests, the EQAO tests, give you some of it, but we need more benchmarking to be, and it doesn't have to be the EQAO method, uh, but they must be, and I think continue to be very much part of it. You need a way to measure the system. Are we stacking up with other provinces, other countries? Can we learn from other countries? What's that data telling us? You need, you need school testing. Are the schools being effective at what they do? And thirdly, you obviously need student testing and other measures of, of uh, student assessment. So no one has argued that the EQAO test should be the only way that a student gets assessed. Absolutely not. But it gives you important information about your child, and, and Gerard explained why that's important, about your school and about the system. The other argument that I, um, uh, I love is this one about their teaching to the test. The test is measuring whether your kid can read or write, so I should hope to heavens they're teaching to the test. First. Is it time for an official acknowledgement of province-wide bargaining <laughs> since we already have it in essence but not in legislation? Provincial bargaining? I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> uh, listen, uh, you know, the provincial uh, dialogue 
which we couldn't interest teachers in for quite a while. Then um, we moved some regulations and things. I, look, I think it's worked in everybody's interest to have a proper outlet. I know that it was short-term advantageous for teachers to be able to take on school boards as provincial entities, but it's just not, it doesn't make any sense. The, the real underlying thing, though, it doesn't matter who's in charge, it's a matter whether it's going to be adversarial. You know, is there a consensus in education today in Ontario? One that people are going to allow to have that be put ahead of their short-term interest? Because that's when self-interest comes out. Whether it's your kid at your school, your board in its particular circumstance, or your union contract is going to prevail if there isn't something bigger than it to come up against. And I guess, to me, that's what matters far more than it. It can happen at a board level, but it's more likely to be tied to things. And, and boards have got to get used to the idea of influencing the provincial agenda as a way to get theirs done. They've got decent mechanisms to do that. They don't put the kind of energy into that necessarily. They still see themselves as a little on the on the local side. So I think, you know, it takes two to tango on the, on, the, on the bargaining sides, but I do think it's time to acknowledge some form of arrangement there, and I, and I do think it can be done well. I think they've shown that in the last <laughs> round, but I, I didn't see, you know, I think each, each time that happens, because it's such a huge amount of resources, and, and I think it's immensely justified. You should see how envious the Americans are. I've been working with a little bit on uh, of our, our teacher quality. It's just because we have uh, something there, I think, to be celebrated. But it can't be all summed up. In fact, if you talk about professional, it could not be summed up on a piece of paper, a contract, or whatever. The mandate has got to be broader, and it's got to come from parents and others. And, and teachers have to feel they're full participants. Then you don't try and make a provincial bargaining solve all those problems. You don't want that. I don't, I don't have too much to add, I, I, but I think I just wanted to pick up on, on what Gerard said about, about the importance, importance of an overarching vision. Uh, for education, and, and I, I have to say, I, I right now I think that's that's lacking, and uh, uh, somehow we, whether it's through the review of the funding formula or whether it's through some sort of an engagement process at, at the at the provincial level, uh, I just wanted to echo that. I, I think I think we need to uh, to broaden the discussion beyond uh, beyond the default, which seems to be uh, student test scores. Yeah, I think uh, I agree that um, it's time to stop pretending that we have um, anything but province-wide bargaining. Um, but I think uh, there's a lot of options in how you do that. And, and um, one of the downsides that people will say, if you have province-wide bargaining, if it goes badly, you'll have a province-wide strike. Um, but any system, whether it's province-wide or school board by school board or, or essential service or arbitration, any labor negotiation mechanism you put in won't work if the relationship doesn't work. Um, so, um, but I think, yes, let's start looking at, at province-wide options. The other thing, though, that I think um, is, is continually between governments and teacher leaders and school board leadership to get on the same page about where you want to go. And I think Michael made a good, make, makes a good point about what is the vision and how much consensus can you buy around going down that road uh, to help minimize your labor disputes. Um, and getting that consensus is, I think, a really, really important thing to try and do so that every time a provincial government tries to initiate a reform that it's not turned into some, some kind of issue um, because change is, is continual. And in everything any of us do, in any walk of life we have, it's just one of the challenges that we're all facing. So let's work on the relationship and the culture and let's take a look at a province-wide system that might actually uh, might actually help work and help a government. It gives, it gives you a provincial government, which is accountable to you, great mechanisms for moving change forward to do province-wide bargaining uh, if, if, uh, if that relationship works. Okay, so one, do one quick clarification. I know I took more time. I, I don't think you should have the provincial wide bargaining on all issues. That that would yeah, negate yeah, the role right, of the yeah. school board yeah. entirely. Not so let me be really clear about yeah. that. That there's a form for whether you want to call it provincial dialogue or call it something else to take take care of the common issues. But there ha it's an important release, and it's also we have some different systems still in Ontario, and they do good things. You don't want a one size fits all that takes that up. But with respect to my friend over here. One of the most dead-end arguments going is the funding formula. And, and frankly, it's an excuse for not having a vision. Hopefully, we'll get a chance to touch on that in a future well, question. Uh, uh, just clarify one, one point. Um, when I said province-wide, I didn't mean province-wide for all issues, because Gerard makes a, a good point on that. And secondly, I wasn't talking about one system for like the four systems that we've got in, in, um, in the education system. I, I want to talk a little bit about uh, uh, 
parent engagement, and, and it comes in, in various forms, but we already <laughs> heard this morning, uh, and we already know that in, in some communities there's, there's a terrific engagement between the school and the home, and the parents and so on, and in other cases, not so much. The school councils were, were, were set up, you know, in theory they were supposed to be about school improvement, and they seem to have defaulted to um, fundraising arms for, uh, for the school good. So my question, I'm going to put it to Janet first, is it time for the minister to reform the role of school councils so that, that in one form or another there is a greater engagement with parents of, uh, of all uh, types and backgrounds and a greater focus on school, uh, the improvement uh, in however it is defined of, uh, of the activities of the school in support of, of the students. Um, those that don't agree with, with parent councils would love to have you spend all your time running around raising money. Um, and while that can be and a function and, and, and part of it, where your value really is, and, how, and there are a lot of options to get us there, uh, where your value really is, is in helping one, your child, but two, your school, to, to uh, deal with the issues and, and to improve. And one of the things that we um, um, uh, established when with the grade three test was to s say to the school, to work out between the teachers, the principal, and the parent council, what are the objectives you think you might want to try and achieve next year? or the year after whatever in the test. Work collectively to make that happen um, and, and continually set to sort of set those targets and those achievements. And I found it one of the, and again, you know, when I was out visiting a lot of the schools to, to see how it was going, to get advice and whatever, and I found it where it was working well, one of the most powerful forces of helping improve student achievement in those schools on the grade three tests. So I think the role is very much on the quality side I don't think we should ban funding, fundraising, but uh, I do think that we have to say, how, how do we get you more involved in where you're going to provide the most value to your child, and to the school, and to the system? You know, the, the, one of the best schools in my riding is, uh, is Parkdale Public School, and you go to their grade eight graduation, and every single parent comes dressed to the nines, comes in their best suit, comes so fired up. So parent engagement is not what you only get to the student council. The question is how to capture that up. And it's parents that should do that. So they had a chance to do that a few years ago. I don't know how it's going in terms of how do people feel about that. The one woe of any parent who wants to make a difference <coughs> on the system as opposed to, you know, the fundraising is easy to understand. You know, my wife does pizza at the school once a week. I'm not sure how the nutritionists think, think of that, but it's the number one fundraising thing for their school. And, and, but they do a lot of other things besides. I, I think school council, the P3E stuff is, is about communication is still the main thing they see themselves doing. I'm not saying the fundraising is a red herring because there's some real issues in there, but the question is going to be how do parents get a chance to meaningfully make a difference at the school board and the provincial level? Without that, you're not going to get the average parent dialing in. And the number one problem right now is the absence of transparency. Janet and I and, and uh, sorry, my, Michael could, could easily stand up here and swear in a Bible about something and none of you would be able to prove us wrong, and that's wrong about, you know, this he said, she said stuff that goes on, the Toronto board, the province, and so on. That has to get solved. I think there should be some independent research capacity, p is a good place to put it, that, that can at least make sure that that doesn't take place, because otherwise too many people chase their tails, and it becomes an inside discussion. So two things, they have to be able to make a decision that the other bodies in education have to live with, that will matter, and then parents will show up. And secondly, transparency has got to be there, and I think it should be in the parents' hands, because, you know, that's the best place for it. Uh, I agree with transparency, and, and one of the things the NDP has proposed in the past is, is that uh, there should be ombudsman, ombudsman oversight over education. It's possibly something to, to explore in terms of, uh, I, I know there are different opinions about that. But, uh, uh, yeah, no, I think in, ter in terms of school councils, I would say, um, I would say, that, that we do have to tackle the, the fundraising issue and that uh, the People for Education reports say that that is becoming the number one sort of preoccupation and, and, and time-consuming thing going on. And uh, while I agree with Janet that uh, banning fundraising is, is, is not the solution, you know, uh, we need to uh, 
look at ways of taking the pressure off parents to uh, pay, keep paying more fees, uh, taking, off, taking the pressure off parents to, to focus on fundraising, giving them the opportunity to, to spend more time in terms of uh, being involved at the school level, at the work council level, uh, around um, the, the, the educational issues that are going on, the, the culture at the school, uh, communicate, doing more around uh, communicating and, and bringing in other parents to be involved. So uh, uh, the NDP had some proposals around uh, fundraising uh, during the election campaign. Uh, one of the suggestions was that uh, every school uh, council should Right now, they get a $500 grant. We, we, we suggested that uh, elementary schools would get about a $4,000 grant, and um, high schools would get about a $6,000 grant. So there's at least some money to start with. So parents don't feel like uh, right away they're doing the, the scholastic book sale and, and, and that they have to do this because there's, there's no money if they don't. And it also makes sure that, that, that schools in, in neighborhoods where they just don't have the time or capacity or contacts uh, to fundraise, they at least have a starting point, right? So there's a bit of a balancing that could go on that way, but I think I think we need a discussion of that. For the two minutes, former ministers of education, what priority were they unable to uh, address? Was the question. Janet, we'll start with you first. Good question. Um, I um, you never get you never do as much as you want to do. Um, I think that's probably a problem every minister has. But I wish uh, I could have continued to take the um, school improvement, as I mentioned earlier, um, uh, where the school, and with, in cooperation with parents, teachers, uh, principals, set targets for improving in grade three and then grade six, and all of those those sort of measurement benchmarks. I think that would have been one thing to uh, uh, to continue to try and work through the system. So I'm a more recently recovering politician than Janet. <laughs> but so I'm going to resist the temptation to debate a little bit of that. But, um, and I know it would be a good debate. Um, I, for me, it was uh, principles. We came in wanting to liberate principles a little bit more. And I just want to say a word on behalf of principles uh, that they were you know, taken out of the union and left in a sort of a bit of an island. It's harder for good teachers to go in and try and be a member of that because they lose their union status and so on. You should really be interested in that. You should really care who the principal is who gets to go in, and, and the reason, and we were, the principals uh, that we worked with wanted us to wait for a study and so on, and they lost, they were supposed to be first in the shoot, and they lost their standing on that, and so, you know, like many other things, once things get going, it's hard to do. That should still be done. The question of how much time they spend, every time somebody in Queen's Park comes up with an initiative, that's more paperwork on the principal's desk. Uh, you know, it's, it, and, and unfortunately, quite often, you know, a good idea gets, somewhat mangled in the process by the time it goes to the different bureaucracies. And there it is, the, the, the poor woman or man is sitting there trying to come up with the time to fill in some forms that is just covering somebody's backside, you know, 150 miles or kilometers away. And, it, and you just got to, that has to be fixed. There's so much potential there for a lead teacher yes. and uh, to work with that. And I, and, and I, and I, I think the teacher federations and uh, other people really need to come together. It's a missing ingredient right now. I think there's good things that have happened. But uh, you can't leave that to chance. You've got to create an environment where that key person um, can be uh, able to do the job that I think everybody acknowledges can and should be done. And uh, so that's the one I regret. When the parent councils were formed in the memorandum, it said, these parent councils must be doing more meaningful things and not be fundraising. Why have we not, how do we monitor that? Because they are fundraising. One thing that any of you would want to change to, to really activate parent involvement? I think more transparency, as Gerard said. I mean, giving, making sure you've got the tools. There's no one issue, you know, that's really going to fix it. But I think that transparency issue is really important. I mean, Gerard said there's been a 35% increase in, in money invested into public education in Ontario. That's a very generous investment in public education. So why are we still fundraising for textbooks? Uh, you know, I, I really worry about the false dichotomy here. You know, you tell, you're going to tell parents you can't do things for their kids? That's not going to happen. And the question is, don't let people fundraise for things that are essentials of education, because then you're, then you're wrecking public education. Yeah. Don't let that happen. But, that, but the real question is, like, there has to be something that the board has to do that either parents have to do a referendum on, or make a decision about, or that the parent and the federation at the school they're deciding something, but the parents have to make a decision. If it's consequential, the busiest of parent is going to show up. 
And don't yeah. tell me it's low income parents that won't show up because they will show up. Don't tell me it's not. Look at who's succeeding right now. I immigrant children are doing better in university than Canadian born. So the, you know, the emphasis on education is there. And the question is, how do we get that to help the system along? The system has got to make some room for parents at the table. And so there has to be a consequential decision. And you'll see a lot more happening. That's a, frankly a bit of the problem for school boards too is how do they get to liberate enough decision making so that they attract people and they feel that they're getting the right to do in their communities. So Michael, anything you want to add? Well just just to say that there is fundraising going on for uh, textbooks and there are course fees being charged for courses that lead to graduation even though both of those are against the Education Act. They're uh, now against the fundraising guidelines and, and the government has not um, I know it's a difficult line to draw what is a necessity and, 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 and you know, but, but the government hasn't shown a willingness to, to work with school boards to, to put a stop to that and to, to adequately fund the essentials of education. And I, I, maybe we'll get to the funding formula. I'm not sure why it's not important to take a look at whether the, the needs for education are being adequately funded or not. I think it is an important dis discussion to have and I think, I think they aren't being met right now. Question. How, how do you give us the actual legislative right to have our voices heard because they're heard on the playground. We know what we want to say, but they aren't heard at the board level and they aren't heard at the school level. Good question. Okay. Um, both of you are picking up on this. Uh, Janet, why don't you jump in? Um, the idea of, of uh, there's a fair bit of debate about whether you want parents to be, how far you go down the decision rule. And, and I think. Gerard's right about consequential decisions. Um, that's one of the reasons why I said the setting of the, the performance targets for your school is something uh, that should be there. But I think what the, the education ministry should be looking at is what specific decision points to you as parents, and I think they need to you know, go back out and talk to the parent councils, um, what specific decision points do you think are most important to you in the school? Where do you want to have the, the, the parents council voice, view, opinion, and then try to build that into, your, into the school performance um, uh, activities and into the government's, uh, you know, when they're setting different policies and what, that they need to know, okay, did the parent council approve this? Did the parent council, was the, were they involved in that? And try to build that right into the policy process on the priorities that parent councils think are, are the most consequential, to use your eyes word, consequential decisions that you think you should be involved in, because there are a number of them uh, that you should be very much part of. Yeah, yeah, I mean, there was a, a good report done uh, it, in the time when I was minister. I'm sure there's been subsequent ones. Uh, and it talked about putting a mandated requirement for each board to have a, a listening post for parents and to have to respond to questions that came up through the parent councils. <coughs> and so, and I thought that that was the beginnings, and it came from parents. The answer is going to have, and, and you know, there's no reason you couldn't have a three month sort of th consultation just on that. What are the things? That, would, that you want to have a say about at your local school, because you're going to have to discuss that, because the professionals will need to know that it's not going to undercut them. You don't want sort of half-baked kind of things. It's very easy to talk about you know, the 0.1% the that has to do with fundraising, but somebody has to take the un unified overall view, and parents should pick some spots in there and think of themselves as you know, kind of parental auditors in terms of fitting in there. Just another word on the, on those, on those, uh, on the fundraising, the principal's budget. You know, how many times do you walk into a school and there's no soap in the damn washrooms? And, and that happens because the, key, the only flexible item in the school is the principal's budget, and he's running out of money at the end of the year for, for, for paper and soap, and then he turns to the parents and says, what do I do? So boards and the ministry have to really look at that whole idea of that discretionary fund at the local, local thing, because that's what creates some of the default needs that then send parents scurrying into some of that kind of stuff. But there also has to be an opening. I'm not sure in student achievement that setting a target and if you had all the parents come in and say, we want to, here's our target, now it's going to happen, would be a very constructive thing. I think there are other contributions. That's not how they, you do it. Yeah, but there's other contributions that they could make. It's not how you um, do it. And, and I just, I think that would be a very interesting debate to have. So the question is, why has it t turned out that the College of Teachers is as unloved as it appears to be? Regulatory professional colleges are never loved. Uh, I don't know one of them, whether you, uh, whether it's uh, law society or accountants or nurses college or doctors college, whatever, they're never loved um, because they are the policemen, uh, because they are the ones that have to make a decision uh, at the end of the day 
um, whether someone gets to continue in the profession or not. But the other role that they have, as I mentioned earlier, is also how do we help this professional get better and, and there are systems built into and should be systems built into uh, when a teacher starts to run into trouble to be able to recognize that, to have a system and a process by which that teacher can get some assistance. But I think one of the things that is undermining the college's uh, integrity right now is this lack of transparency. Um, that the star highlighted, and I think so. That they need to to figure out how they deal with that. There are times when confidentiality is important, but at the end of the day, the test is what's in the public interest in the college. Anything that either you want to add or? Sure. I think it. You know, it was it was born in difficult circumstances, yeah. and it was seen. It felt like it was imposed, and that added to some of the the issue. I'm not I'm not saying that to be critical. I just I think it, it's probably agreed that those are the circumstances. Um, it, it is yet to be born in the minds of most teachers. So in, in the first five or ten years, it sort of, there's a solidified attitude. I say to every teacher in the room, you're making a huge mistake if you don't take the teacher, college of teachers as the expression of your personal and professional ethics. And, and if you don't do that, it, something else will come along and take its place. But you also, that's how teachers live their lives day to day, and then therefore it should be a true reflection. That there's, so there's a longer answer to your question. It's, I don't know how worthwhile it is to go back as opposed to look at where it's at. And, and I don't have, personally, I went and looked at their website, I don't have all the data to know whether some of those concerns that were just there in the cusp of the Toronto Star article, are they really justified or not? How many teachers are X'd out? How many people are counseled out? How much transparency is there taking place? That stuff really needs to be there for people to have uh, in large confidence. But to first people to be sure of that should be the, should be the teachers. And, you know, difficult history or not, this entity, something like it needs to exist and needs to have everybody's confidence. Michael? No. Why isn't the co College of Teachers uh, appearing not to be as focused as it ought to be on, on good or bad teacher practices as opposed to the criminal element? Janet? College should do both. I mean, that's what a professional self-regulatory self profession is all about. And the college, uh, and again, getting back to the credibility of the college, um, they should be uh, uh, putting in place a way that is assessing a teacher's capability. If the teacher is, and the teacher gets assessed professionally as every other profession gets, you know, or, or all of us in our jobs, various ways. So what is the best way to do that? And then where are they falling down? And if they are falling down, how do we give them, because the first thing is how do you fix it? But at the end of the day, if it can't be fixed, the person should be advised that perhaps teaching is not their, their, uh, the job that they should be doing. So it's both. They are both equally important. Well, you, you, can't, you can't divorce that, though, from the role of the principal and the school board. I mean, you don't want to wait for a college of teacher hearing on a teacher that doesn't have the capacity to be in the classroom. And so there are probation things, there are other things that should happen. That's where you've got it. I mean, if you've got a child that's at risk because somebody has no classroom management or whatever it is, the college isn't really for that. The college is meant to say, we're a profession, is what teachers and doctors and others profess. Therefore, we'll be held to a higher standard than the criminal standard. And we will arbitrate this higher standard. These are our codes of ethics. We, will, we want your trust, or at least we've accepted your trust. We'll live up to it. So that's their zone. But there's a different zone of management on the idea of whether somebody is competent to trust overall, there is a licensing kind of thing. There's now a mentoring type of thing that happens. There's a, but there, that's where they come together as to whether or not that person loses that privilege of teaching. Because it is a privilege to say, I am up to this higher standard. So, you know, I think you should hold out that expectation, but you should hold out the expectation for your principal, your school board, and the federation who may or may not, you know, will be involved at some point protecting their members. On, but no, no, but that's but an earnest, there's nothing wrong with that, but that process should work. And at the end of the day, there should be a lot of transparency about that, but don't, don't think the college is going to be yeah, reaching so the classroom. you got to give the principals the tools. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. uh, can you just move them to another school? Yeah. yeah. I, mean, I mean, I guess it does, it does raise the question sort of more broadly, where is the accountability and the transparency, and, and does, does there need to be some sort of a, an independent body that, that oversees public education in, in our province? Um, I mean, in a way, it, it seems... Ministry of Education. Well, I said, no, I said independent. I said independent. So you don't have the Ministry of... Hmm? But how do you vote for an independent person? You can do something with Gerard. Well, I'm just saying that, that other, other ministries have... Uh, 
you know, there are there is an independent right. oversight, and so I'm just asking that question. If you were, if you were sitting in the seat of minister today, what would you be doing in order to rectify the problem as, as far as the lack of transparency? Okay. I'd give enough money to people for education to hire five full-time people. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, not, I'm not kidding at P3 yeah. because I, I don't know where it's at these days and so on. But let's take a group that has that they've earned a lot of earned credibility. But the point is, some safe place to put five people who will be independent and who will answer all your questions on money. Okay, because it, it, the money confusion is what everybody's stock and trade is. You know, when I read the platforms, uh, you know, I really worried. What I said at the beginning, I really mean, you're in trouble if you care about public education because you're not getting the straight goods from anybody right now. It's easy for a government. The government at least had a mandate before and put it up. The opposition parties didn't put up anything. Yeah. Anything is a counter vision whatsoever. Without that, you don't get the creativity. You don't get the push. You need to know where the money is. You know, I had my own people working on the weekends to find out where the money was when I was the minister. And Janet, I actually found $140 million that wasn't attached anywhere after eight years of conservative government. I mean, we just, the, the point is, everybody. What did you spend it on? <laughs> We spent, it, we spent it on class size and, and all those good things. And, and the, but the point I would make is, like, Rick, stay, like, if you want an insider's, one insider's uh, advice, stay very, very focused there. Don't, don't, I mean, even people for education in its current state can't tell you, you know, uh, they can tell you what, what's bad, what looks bad, but they don't, you've got to get the full story board by board. And even the board members themselves, frankly, they should have their own political controller okay. in each board to tell them, make sure they're getting the straight goods. All right, so Janet, a quick uh, pick up from you. Just, uh, I, agree with, I agree with Gerard. Um, I think having more information, the value of the funding formula is that it, it, it started to actually get at that. And I agree it needs to be reviewed. I thought we'd put in a, a, a five-year review uh, in the legislation. If we didn't, we should have. Uh, because that should be in there, so it is being constantly assessed. But giving you as parents more ability to get that information is really, really important. Let, they have a quick point. Um, there's a lot of interest in ombudsmans and independent bodies and whatever. I gotta tell you, when you're mad about what's happening in your education system, you can go yell at people like Gerard and I. You can go yell at your school board trustee. You can go defeat us at the polls if you're not happy. But an independent ombudsman and all of those people, you don't. You have no way to, and there's a whole bunch of them running around our political system right now, and it's taking accountability away from elected officials it's giving them to wonderful committed bureaucrats, but you can't access or influence them. Elected folks, you can. And so for me, that accountability should still stay there with the people that you hire and fire as voters. So we're, we're making Michael a kind of a pro tem minister yeah, of education. So you've got two, just a very quick rebuttal to make the gentleman at the back with a question. Well, Jared was kind of whispering to me, asking me about examples of uh, independent oversight um, or accountability. And I, I guess, uh, I mean, one would be uh, there's an environmental commissioner who uh, is uh, fully independent of, of the government who holds the, the government's feet to the fire on uh, issues of, of climate change, water quality, air quality, and, and, and those reports actually uh, hold some weight and, uh, and, and citizens can go to the environmental commissioner and raise raise a concern about the quality of the environment. There's a Health Quality Council, which I think its role is to independently report on uh, the quality of, of health care. Um, why not uh, something equivalent in education? What would you say to a school council, if you were to talk to them for one or two minutes, to explain to them your understanding of their mandate or okay. all right. I think it's changed a lot since since I was minister, so I'm not sure what the legislation or whatever is. But um, you are there to make sure that the school is doing what the children in that school need to have happen, whether it's safety, whether it's um, uh, curriculum, whether it's quality of teaching. What you know, that, and that's a very broad topic. And you are not you're not the professional educators. That's a different role. But you are there to, to take a look at that data, the information, what's happening in the school with your child, et cetera, and to provide that feedback loop to the principal, who is, uh, uh, you know, again, Gerard and I agree, is a very important leader, and to your local trustees and your local elected MPPs. So I don't know if that answers the question, but that's where I think it should be. Gerard. Yeah, there's, there's, no, uh, there's, no, there's no real mandate that I think, there's things you're supposed to do there's not consequences you're supposed to have. So I, I don't. I think what you're looking for needs to be still put into place. The, the parent 
involvement report, the parent voice report from 2006, would be a good place to start. They did a pretty good job. You don't have to reinvent everything, but there may be a better one done since then. Mm -hmm. But those powers have to arrive. You know, some people want uh, school councils to hire principals and things like that. I think you should take a lot of care with even with, with contemplating that at all. But but I think there are other things that you that should could be consequential, and and they should be in that agenda. So you can't call a meeting now, and and the principal has to come. You can call a school meeting, although you know you can reach all parents. I, those are some existing powers that people should use as a way of coming up with you know a mandate. And and I think the, you know that those kind of things have to be developed. And I'm, I'm pretty sure there are some parent councils out there that do these things well. And those models people should be looking to as much as what's in legislation. You don't have power to make, to, to not be ignored yet, it, it'd be my sense, except by your principal. Okay, you need, some, you need something by the board. The, the principal has to take into account, you need something from the board, and something where the ministry has to take the collective parent voice into account as well. Michael, please. Yeah, I think it's a, it's a good question, and what it, what it raises to me is I, th I think there, there isn't a broad awareness amongst parents and, and community members just about what their rights are as members of, of parent councils, and I think, I think there needs to be, <laughs> there needs to be, uh, school councils, there needs to be more clarity about that. Yes. What would your party do, if elected, to support the education of parents within the council community of what the roles are. I have to say I'm a policy researcher, not a policy maker. Here's your chance. We can do it in Um. I don't have a, I don't have a quick perfect answer to that except uh, it, it follows on the previous question I, th I think in terms of um, if we're serious about uh, parents being involved uh, I think I think there has to be some clarity exactly about what the role uh, parents uh, can expect can have uh, I, I know as a as a parent uh, of of two kids uh, there's there's Who's participated on on uh, on council, school councils? Um, I, I, there's there is a lot to, of work to be done in terms of broadening involvement. I don't I don't I, I don't yeah I don't know if there's I have a, a quick answer to that. But anyway, I'm happy to talk with you after more about it. Okay, Well, there's there's supposed to be a provincial student a parent voice elected by parents, and there should be a, they should have enough money to train parents to go out and train new parents each year. That would be the best model. And, and, and maybe they do and maybe they don't, I don't, I don't know. But there's, the, 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 there's supposed to be sort of a regional that then becomes a picking of the, the provincial people. I don't know if that exists. I'm sorry, I refreshed myself. But that was the plan. And I think it's, it's a good thing. In other words, there should be enough resources with parents to orient the new parents come in, so they know those expectations, and they have a chance to tweak them too as they get in. Because otherwise, just as parents get an idea of what's going on, the school year ends, and then you have yeah. turnover, and then you have a disempowering of people. So again, it's you need to be really clear about what you should do, and where you know. It's, and but those those lines with some flexibility could be drawn, and the education could be done very very easily and quite cheaply. Um, the, the parent council idea, and again, I would be very unhappy if, if the structure that, that two governments worked on putting in place is not there anymore, about having a parent council and regional bodies and a, a selection appointments or election. There's a lot of different options to get there, but that I think is one important structure. But there's, there's three things that, um, that come to mind. One, um, why don't we get some community colleges to put together some, some who are really sometimes very quick at putting together uh, courses that respond to people's needs on being on parent councils. Um, so that you can go and take it, uh, and it, it tells you all the tricks, and it should be delivered by people who've been on parent councils, etc. So that might be one way. So there's there's a way for you to go to get some consistent information. Secondly, the people that there should be people in the ministry whose job it is to work with parent councils in the schools to help you resolve issues. Thirdly. The ministry needs to continue to expand the information that is available to you uh, as parents, whether it's in your school or your school board or system-wide, because again, that information is power.